Good morning. It'd be go good to know that I was Herman Godwin and I would yield the rest of my time to him. <laughs> when I look into the faces here this morning and I felt this way yesterday as I walked around the corridors, I know I am looking at the youth of America. And I should begin anything that I would say with once upon a time. <laughs> the website of this foundation quotes Ralph Waldo Emerson, who advised us to go where there is no path and to leave a trail. Each time I go to uh, this website, I am so pleased to see story after story um, of alumni who took paths they could not have imagined and followed those paths to rewarding enrichment and personal growth. So once upon a time, I found a path wholly unexpected, and I hope that remembering it now might be worthwhile. It was 1983, and a law partner of mine, Robert Sink, whose son, Wilson Sink, is a Moorhead Kane scholar in the class of 2017 and is here today. Uh, Kane asked me to come to his office, as I recall it, and he told me of a new ruling by the Social Security Administration, um, one that was denying and terminating disability benefits uh, for North Carolina citizens. Bob Sink had learned about this development from speaking with his friends at the Legal Aid Office, and the leaders of the Legal Aid Office had learned from their colleagues around the nation that thousands of citizens afflicted with various disabilities were feeling the brunt of this new policy. When he came to me, Bob explained that legal aid needed the help of a private law firm, perhaps ours, to prosecute a class action against the federal government. And he wanted to know whether I was willing to lead an effort to get that done, to be joined for sure by lawyers from legal aid a Moorhead Law alumnus in our firm, Herman Spence, who is also here today, joined that effort and proved to be invaluable. I've always believed that Bob Sink came to see me because he knew I was well acquainted with the lawyers from Legal Aid, because I had been in the federal court against them representing the Charlotte Housing Authority. My vivid memory is that I lost every case, or nearly every case. <laughs> At the end of each day in court, we would go out for drinks and dinner, and they would explain, always so graciously, why I had lost again. <laughs> we had become friends, and my regard for them was high, as well they knew. We filed this class action for disabled citizens in North Carolina. The path was unexpected, and was as was the partnership with the legal aid lawyers. Those whom I had known well, who had been my opponents, had now become my teammates. The case was assigned to Judge James B. McMillan, the first judge in the nation to use school busing as an instrument to desegregate the public schools, leading to threats on his life and the bombing of the offices of the lawyers representing the plaintiffs. The lead plaintiffs the lead plaintiff was Patrick Henry Hyatt. Mr. Hyatt had lost his home and his car because the loss of disability benefits meant that he could no longer support himself and his family. His creditors had even repossessed his recliner chair, the only thing in the world that could relieve his searing back pain. The trial took place in early 1984. Judge McMillan issued an injunction that made the news. The injunction is easy to spot in the federal reporters. It is typed in all capital letters, a reflection of Judge McMillan's view of the federal government's treatment of the disabled. The government sought an emergency appeal to the United States Court of Appeals. That court upheld the merits of Judge McMillan's ruling, but drastically reduced the number of citizens eligible to re for having their benefits restored. We had one court left to ask for help. And sparing all the details, with great relief, the Supreme Court 
uh, granted our petition and reinstated Judge McMillan's ruling in full. After the Supreme Court's ruling, the government's recalcitrance continued. At one hearing, an enforcement proceeding we brought in the federal courthouse in Charlotte. Judge McMillan asked the lawyers representing the Secretary of Health and Human Services, by that time a leading appellate justice department fellow, asked him the following. What do you see? What do you see in the rulings of this court, or the United States Court of Appeals, or the Supreme Court, that authorizes your client one step below the President of the United States to continue to deny these plaintiffs their disability benefits? The Justice Department lawyer did not lack for aplomb or erudition in his answer. He went on for a while. I, uh, I sensed, however, watching the body language of the court and having an eye for the redness of complexion <laughs> that the judge was not fully persuaded. <laughs> he then turned his chair ever so slightly toward me and our table. I sensed it was my time to speak, even though I did not know what to say when I rose to my feet. Then Judge McMillan asked me this question. Counselor, well, what do you see? Your Honor, I have been listening closely and taking notes. But a few moments ago, I did look up. And I believe, I believe I saw Elvis. <laughs> And based on what my opponent has been saying, I believe he has seen him too. <laughs> Before this case concluded, <laughs> we would return to the United States Court of Appeals four more times and have numerous hearings before Judge McMillan, all to combat the government's continued efforts to reduce its liability, estimated to exceed in North Carolina $480 million per year. When Legal Aid told us what we could expect as this case began, they estimated that two, perhaps three years, would be necessary, and that the benefits for 5,000, perhaps 10,000 North Carolinians hung in the balance. They assured us of one thing, there would be no funds to pay our fees. By the time the case concluded, it had reached the 15-year mark. Legal Aid estimates 50,000 North Carolinians receive disability benefits pursuant this time to lawful standards. The estimate of the funds for our fees remained constant. <laughs> I leave you with an episode Near the end of the... <laughs> Perhaps that is a signal I should leave you now. Some think they were better off. Yeah. Is the mic working, buddy? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very well. I'll leave you with an episode uh, that took place near the beginning of our journey down this path. As the first day of the trial was concluding, uh, I was walking out with my co-counsel from Legal Aid, and a gentleman tapped me on the shoulder on the way out of the courtroom. When I turned around, I heard a halting, monotone voice. Uh, and that voice asked me, how do you think it's going? I told him, because I have been talking so much, I don't think I know. And I turned the question on him. And then he said he had little idea 
because he had almost no hearing at all and he could not read my lips during the courtroom because after all our backs were turned to him. And then he added, Mr. Lawyer, I know you are trying hard and I know what you are being paid and I wanted to say for all of us today, thank you. That exchange with my client, one of many I had never met, holds a special place in my memory, holds a special place among the unexpected features of this unexpected experience. At that moment, in that courtroom, standing with colleagues who had become brothers and sisters, I took in something that stays with me. It meant more then, and it means more today, more even than seeing Elvis.